Francisco Aguilar, entrepreneur and designer, CEO, CTO, and co-founder of Bouncing Imaging, oh, excuse me, Bounce Imaging, based in the Harvard Innovation Lab in Alston. Um, Aguilar is developing low-cost baseball-sized devices embedded with cameras and sensors that can literally be thrown into risky or life-threatening situations to gather images and data. All you Navy SEALs, heads up. The device, called the Bounce Imaging Explorer, transmit the, transmits the images and data to mobile devices, cell phones, tablets, to help find survivors of disasters, determine areas, whether areas are safe for entry to see, just see what's going on in there when you can't actually stride right in. He's working to provide police officers, firefighters, soldiers with the same search and surveillance capabilities that elite Navy SEAL teams have now. Current imaging and sensor devices, too costly, too complex, bounce imaging devices are designed to make life-saving imaging and sensor technology accessible to those who need it most. He's named um, the Explorer unit, the baseball size Jabi, was named one, I think that's the technical term, was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of 2012. His company, Bounce Imaging, received the gold winner award of $50,000 at Mass Challenge, the biggest startup accelerator in the world here in our backyard. He came up with the idea while reading about the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, and after that crisis, a lot of people buried in rubble, and they just couldn't be found or discovered. Uh, founded Bounce Imaging last year while working uh, on an MBA at, the, at MIT and a master's in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Please join me in welcoming Francisco Aguilar. How cool. Francisco. Uh, well, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with such a great list of speakers uh, to uh, reiterate some of the things that Nina was talking about in terms of uh, international collaboration on science. Half of our technology is developed here in the Boston area. The other half is developed uh, in the image processing side uh, in my native Costa Rica at the Institute of Technology in Cartago. Um, so see a lot of that point about international collaboration. So um, I guess we'll start. So as, as Tom just said, uh, it's weird to the guy you listen to on the radio every morning to say, as Tom just said. Um, if uh, <laughs> we all remember the Haiti earthquake, uh, 2010, uh, hundreds of thousands of people buried under the rubble, um, and in the 48 hours after the after the earthquake, international rescue teams, uh, some from the U.S., began to arrive. I think Iceland got got there first in 24 hours. The rest of them about two or three days later, and they brought some very cool equipment. And they started uh, pulling people, finding people in the rubble and pulling them out. And they did a fantastic job, about 40 teams, rescued about 150 people. Half of those were rescued by uh, US teams that had the most sophisticated equipment. So a pretty remarkable story from that perspective. Um, but the problem, of course, is that when you have an earthquake, a calamity of this scale, 90% of the people that are going to be rescued are going to be rescued in the first 48 hours. Uh, after that, the window of survival drops off very quickly. And then the other problem is that if you have only a few teams with advanced equipment, um, there's only so many places they can reach. And so there were thousands and thousands of people that, that we didn't get to in time. And so you might say, well, aren't there you know, fiber optic scopes and robots and drones and all kinds of really cool equipment that we can use to search through uh, both these calam you know, tragic situations and other more daily kind of occurrences. And it's true, there's some very cool equipment. The problem is that they're generally way too expensive, um, not, I mean, certainly for a developing country, but even for a local search and rescue department in, say, Sacramento that we've been talking to, um, to actually afford. And second, they're pretty hard to operate. They require someone who's trained, they take somebody out of the mission to actually operate the unit. Um, and it turns out, that fortunately, major tragedies like the Haiti earthquake are relatively rare, but every single day we ask first responders to go into unseen hazardous spaces without the tools to see what's inside. So, uh, you know, we've seen both uh, here in Boston uh, having to search broad areas with a lot of police uh, during the Boston bombings, uh, school shootings where you've got patrol officers that are now taking on the role that SWAT teams used to have because there just isn't time to wait. Uh, we talked about search and rescue. 
uh, soldiers in Afghanistan trying to determine whether the compound has civilians inside or insurgents without, being, without having to enter. Um, we, and uh, industrial safety, all sorts of applications where you really need to know what's on the other side, but you don't have the tools to get there. Um, and so as Chad, a 20-year veteran of the Las Vegas Police Department puts it, um, it's either you or the dog uh, that goes in through the door, faces the danger on the other side, endangering not only the officer, but also the people on the other side because you've entered in this kinetic, dynamic situation. So what we're, trying to, what we're developing are low-cost, throwable sensors that you can toss into a space and get back a panoramic image of that space to quickly allow you to assess the dangers within um, and at a cost that's low enough that it's accessible to your frontline patrol officer to your local uh, search and rescue worker at the fire department. So we take uh, a ball like this with cameras that get a full panoramic view of the space, wide angle cameras that cover in all directions. Toss it into the space and flash the room in the near infrared, so just outside the visual spectrum, but light it up like a Christmas tree. Give you a quick view of the space, something like this and overlay it with other data that you can pick up with relatively standardized sensors for measurement. So you can quickly assess, is there somebody in the room? Is that person armed? Is that person wounded? Um, in a way that's relatively easy to access. And everyone knows how to use a tablet or smartphone where we send the information, and everyone knows how to toss a ball. So you don't need special training. And you can buy this for the cost of things that are already deployed to police officers. So same price point as like a taser. OK, so we're here at the ideas thing. And we've shown you the, tech the technology that we're working on. It's kind of cool tech. But what are, what are the big ideas that we think uh, we're a small part of um, that we're seeing more broadly? The first of them is you know, we're a startup, you know, uh, a business trying to develop a product for the world. And often startups can be quite silly. This is absolutely real. My social pet work is a startup. Um, but they can also change the world. So a fellow company at uh, the Harvard Innovation Lab, or actually just moving out of the Harvard Innovation Lab, uh, Vaxess, who you should all look up, is developing uh, a silk-based protein that can stabilize vaccines, eliminating the need for the cold chain, uh, and giving access to vaccines to people who never could have been reached. So millions and millions of people will not have access to vaccines because of this very cool startup um, out of our own lab. The second part is that we live in a world uh, where everyone thinks, uh, especially in the startup world, everyone's, everyone wants to make the next app. If you want to get VC funding, put the word social app and cloud somewhere in a presentation, <laughs> and you're set. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's quite attractive, because you, know, you can code a very simple web page or a very simple application in a day if you have some basic coding. Um, it's really easy to prototype, and, and you can do some really cool things, and we're connecting people. But in the real world, we often do need hardware. Um, and, and to be clear, we actually use a lot of software. But hardware really does matter. And, and the example that I wanted to pull for that is a fellow Mass Challenge winner from last year, Grit, here at, uh, based out of, coming out of MIT, based here in Boston, developing all-terrain uh, wheelchairs accessible all over the world and very cleverly made out of bicycle parts so that when your wheelchair gets damaged in a rural village in India, you can go to a bike mechanic and just get the wheel changed out instead of having to go and buy expensive parts somewhere else. So very cool technology. Much harder to develop a prototype like this than to develop a, you know, a, a quick uh, you know, prototype application, but really changes lives, really makes a difference. And then the last point um, that really drives what we're trying to do is that often we can build, we could build the, the very cool, very sophisticated, very fancy technology, but simple, low-cost solutions can really, really change the world. I had the opportunity to work for uh, Roshan, a project of the Aga Khan in Afghanistan um, that uh, basically uh, brought access to telecommunications into Afghanistan. And in the process, they created the largest company, well, the largest non-heroin company in Afghanistan, uh, the largest employer, the largest taxpayer, and they fundamentally transformed lives for millions of Afghans, who before, to make a, make a call, would have to walk sometimes 700 miles to get to an international phone line. Um, and so a technology that you can buy for, uh, you can buy the cards for less than a dollar, 
fundamentally transformed people's lives in a way that millions and millions of dollars of aid work didn't. Um, and so a lot of that is what's inspiring what we're doing at Bounce Imaging. Low cost products that are broadly accessible, simple to use, simple technologies, using hardware and software, um, and trying to help those who put their lives on the line for us every day. So, thank you for your time. I'll keep it short so Rudy can blow your mind. It's great. great. It's great. Oh my gosh. Rudy. I left all Rudy's stuff over there in my, in my boat. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll work with that. Um, what do the Navy SEALs use? Before your, is your thing out there already? You're going to have um, a prototype out we're soon? We're going into testing with New England Police Departments in the next couple months. Fingers crossed, our boards are getting assembled right now. So. Is, is this it? This one you can't throw. This one I screwed up the overmold on. But this is the form factor. Our current prototype. the weight of it? Uh, it's missing the batteries, so it's, a, it's about a pound. Um, it sees you. <laughs> and you, uh, we get the, uh, this will give you a quick view of the. Uh, so this is it. What the imaging will look like. What do seals use? They use something like this or some, what, you suggest that so they give have you a something. Quick view of the kind of space. This is our lab back in oh, Cambridge. Oh, nice. This lab looks um, nice. So, uh, yeah, no, so what, things that, uh, well, some of them are, so actually my, uh, my partner in this is a former Army Ranger, so there's certain things he can tell me about, and certain things he can't tell me about. Okay. But they've got some very advanced technologies that often let you see through walls. They've got robots. They've got very fine scopes. Um, but those things are in the range of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and are usually not accessible to right. some, so like I mean, a We know some office. of this out of MIT, seeing around corners and all that, using reflected light. Yeah, yeah. Aggregate. Uh, uh, Ramesh's lab yeah. does that, yeah. Um, so, but this. Although much of that is way over the horizon. Uh, very far, you know, there's like micro drones, things that, little insect drones, and you see all of this technology, but it's really quite maybe 10 years out from really being in the field. I'm always curious about military funding. Are they interested in this? Are they funding you? Are they buying? We, our first focus is law enforcement. We are talking to the military about that application, uh, but where we see the pressing need right now is for police, because policing has really changed in the last 10 years or so. Um, and after Columbine, after Newtown, um, we, uh, police are really being put into very unusual, difficult situations without yeah. the equipment to. Is this? To do you picture this mainly for? Thank you. Mainly for disaster relief, or mainly for there's bad guys in there and you want to see how they're armed. So we we see it for both. It's really the the. The situation, it's a pretty broad problem having to see it in dangerous spaces. So um, a lot of what police uh, are running into these days are things like domestic disputes. You'll have um, a couple and let's say the, the, the boyfriend will be locked behind a door, you know, there'll be a window right. or something. Um, and unfortunately more and more, the answer is to knock down the door and be very kinetic, aggressive. very aggressive. Yeah. Kinetic. We're trying to give that option to yeah. To, to scale that back, to actually get a, an assessment for what's going on, get a sense for what's going on, and avoid things that endanger officers, but also endanger civilians on the other what side. What about the legal issues? The policeman comes to my door. No, he comes to Skip Gates' door, <laughs> and he knocks. He says, good evening, Mr. Gates. How are you doing? And may I come in? And Skip Gates says no, and he just bowls this in. Yeah. Is so, that legal? Um, we, got, uh, you know, they're looking in the... Yeah, so SWAT teams already have a range of equipment that they, that they can use. So they'll use pole cameras, they'll use... Um, but it's legal? I'm, if I, I said, no, you can't come in, you can toss in your bounce ball If anyway there's imminent call. danger, right. So if you think that there's imminent danger. So, so what, what a SWAT officer might do now, when we're, we're talking, for example, to the uh, main corrections department. What they'll, what they'll do now, if there's like a prisoner locked behind a gate, is they'll have an officer come with like a stick and a camera on it and stick it through the window you can see, one, those things are really expensive, and so they're not very broadly accessible. But right. two, you've got somebody exposed holding the camera, right. potentially getting hurt. But it is, I mean, so, so in emergency situations, that is what they do, because the alternative is going through the door and potentially hurting people on the other and side. And maybe this is old hat now, but I mean, I'm thinking of this. You can see all the little lenses in here. You toss this, and it's just bouncing wildly. Well, it's not like a Super Bowl. It's, it's actually, it's a nice, no, but gentle I mean, it's, bounce. It's, <laughs> yeah. <are> you, um, <laughs> But still, the software's out there that will stitch together this random giant 360 glob of, of images tricky. and turn it into a rational image like you showed us. It looks so... Yeah, yeah. So, so this is our, our prototype. I don't know if anyone else can see it, but this is our lab out in Cambridge. Oh, and you're saying you photographed it with this ball. Uh, the bigger cousin of that ball, Okay, yeah. but you walk through just like... I bet you walk just like that, <laughs> right? Here you're talking about tossing it in. 
Yeah, so... Is it not going to be a mishmash of, oh my God, look like a kaleidoscope? So if we were doing video, it would certainly do that. So uh -huh. what we do is we take the simple approach. We take stills, and we then use an accelerometer to give you the orientation, and then we paste them in space where they should be. And so there are little fuzzy issues in little corners and little seams, but it gives you a relatively quick assessment of the space. And then you can navigate, and again, I'm sorry that I can't show this on the camera, but then you can navigate a little more uh, in detail if you go into the yeah, So we're kind of roaming around the space with these, okay, so there's snapshots, snapshots, snapshot, but they kind of make sense. Um, what's your projection? How many will you sell in uh, 2015? Oh, man. Tens of thousands, ideally. There's 800,000 police officers in the U.S. 800,000? We'd love to have one in every belt. Are we going to see one of these next to their handcuffs in every one of those belts? One of the interesting things about the police market is that when they see a technology that helps, they adopt it very quickly. So things yeah. like taser, license plate recognition, um, in-car uh, cameras and, and computers have 80, 90 percent penetration. So, I mean, that's obviously a hope and a dream, and we'll see if we can get there. But we do... You picked out your boat? What's that? You picked out your boat? Oh, uh, no, no. <laughs> Just kidding. If only. Well, probably again, will. again. We're laughing were now, this, but you'll be laughing later. Were this an app-enabled social uh, yeah. platform, that might be true. Hardware's, hardware's hard. Uh, so. Listen, it's just great. It's really cool that you're doing it. We hope you save a, a million lives, or don't need to, but either way that the capacity is out there. It's great. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Francisco Aguilar and Bounce Imaging. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Francisco, and good luck to you.